I am pleased to introduce Elizabeth Thompson from uh, the Noble Consortium, North of Boston Library Exchange. Uh, prior to her starting this, I want to thank our sponsors for the Evergreen Conference, our champion sponsors being Equinox, who is uh, sponsored the Hopin platform to allow the presentations, Emerald, who is sponsoring our captioning, and then Mobius got in on the action just to support us. And so those three champion sponsors, we are very grateful to and want to acknowledge their contribution to this. Elizabeth is going to be talking about things that I use on a daily basis, even as somebody working at the admin level for a consortium. And so I'm very excited to hear what she has to say about batches, baskets, buckets, and book bags. Elizabeth, are you ready to take it away? I am. Is my sound okay? You do. And I will remind everybody that this is also being recorded and um, the recording will be available later. So I'm going to turn off my mic, unshare my screen, and you are good to go. Okay, thank you, Ruth. Um, we're going to be talking about batches, baskets, buckets, and book bags. Four things that have something in common. They're all about groups of items or groups of, of bibliographic records. And for some reason, they're confusing to people. It might be because they're called batches, baskets, buckets, and book bags. Um, all of them are containers in one sense or another. Um, for item records, we have batch. Batch is not technically a container. It's a temporary group of items that are pulled together for a particular task. And that group goes away when you shut the tab. So it's a, it's a, it's a batch only as long as you are looking at it. It's not permanent in any way. Um, item buckets are also a group of items, but it's a persistent group of items that stays in a container, a bucket, um, on the system until you delete that. And when we get to bibliographic records, a basket is a temporary group of, whoops, that's supposed to be bibliographic records, and it will be right after the session. It's a, it's, so it's a temporary group of title records, bibliographic records, and that group goes away when you clear the basket or end the session. And baskets are part of the catalog and they are they are used by both patrons and and staff. Um, record buckets are a persistent group of bibliographic records and they stay on the system until the bucket is deleted. Um, we find it confusing sometimes the term record bucket because items are records and bibliographic buckets are records but but uh, um, here that's what we're talking about. And book bags, also known as my lists, is the patron version of record buckets. And carousels, we're going to talk about just one thing about carousels as they relate to um, bibliographic record buckets. So an item batch. An item batch is a group of items brought together in the item status screen, which is also called the search for items by barcode on the search menu. The items can be scanned or uploaded from a file or a combination of the two. And a file of barcodes um, sometimes comes from a report. Uh, they're useful for many different types of projects, batch updates, batch check-in, batch deleting, updating inventory dates, uh, data cleanup, um, managing items that are going in and out of storage, any kind of special project where you have a pile of items and you want to do something to them and then put them away. Um, item batches are not persistent. They live in the moment and they go away when you, when you close the tab. So this is the item status screen. Um, the, I think probably the most common way to use this screen is to use that scan item barcode thing so that you've got this pile of items and a scanner and you're just scanning the barcodes and they, you know, appear in the list below. Um, but that, that same uh, box there, as you see with the little pop-up thing, um, can take a single barcode 
or a list of barcodes that are separated with commas. So if you have something from a CSV file, comma separated fi va uh, value file, um, you can uh, those right in there. And then the other option there is to choose a file. So I apparently have uploaded a file here that's called dogstorybarcodes.txt. Um, and the file format is just one barcode per line. Um, you know, no, nothing else. Um, we usually use just a plain old text file for that. And that's handy. Either one of the two batch options there, the single barcode, the uh, CSV barcodes or the files um, are useful when you've got that data already because you're working with the items that are pulled from some report. So they may be um, items that were not found on the shelf and you want to delete them or not them missing or items that for whatever reason you want to act on. Um, and you can. So on this screen, once you have the items there, um, you can select some or all of them. You're often selecting all and then you can take some action. And this is the you know, Swiss Army knife of the system. It gives you the ability to do many different things. So you can edit them, delete them, update the inventory date, print labels, manage alerts and copy tags, mark missing, edit call numbers, and much more. Um, these, in fact, this is a long drop down, so I had to split it here. But these are all the actions that you can do um, uh, to a batch of, of items in that item status screen. Um, often you're working on all of them, so you want to select them all and delete them. You, you intentionally brought them together as a batch that needs the same action. Uh, but you can also um, select just a group of them and then perform an action on them. Um, here, I've sorted them. Sorting is often a way to kind of find mini groups within a larger group. Um, so here, I've apparently sorted them on the call number prefix because I want to do something specific to the ones that have the prefix uh, J graphic. Maybe we're changing that prefix or removing that prefix and putting them into the regular J books or whatever. So by sorting them, it made it easy for me to find a particular grouping of them. Um, and select them to do something with them. Um, that item status screen is often useful. Um, there may be times when you want to sort by that because you want to do something different with the items that are checked out. For example, you can't just delete them um, and the items that are currently available. So sorting is a very useful way to kind of find mini batches within the larger batch. Um, while we're looking at that grid, I made certain choices here about what, what columns are showing. Um, and managing the columns is very useful if what you want to do is download the grid or print the grid, but typically you're downloading the grid. Um, whatever columns you have appearing, the column order, the sorting, the width uh, is well worth uh, setting or changing. Um, if you are trying to download a CSV file to use in Excel or Google Sheets for more advanced formatting or analysis or, or whatever. Um, so you have that drop down that lets you um, manage the column, set the width, um, turn on and off whatever, um, whatever uh, columns you want to have on your report, which may be different for a project than the columns you're typically looking at day to day. Uh, so you, you have the option here to change them. And when you do change them, you have the option to save the columns, which makes those the new setting, or not save the columns because you are just changing them for this project, for this CSV file that you're trying to download. Uh, you can also use the print button. I'm not sure how often people do that. Um, there is a receipt template, the item status receipt template. Uh, and I think this is just the default for that. But that is if, if you want to be able to just print things, whether using a receipt printer or using um, a, a different printer, then you, you can um, configure that. So all of that is just a batch. It's like, take this 
group of items, do something with it, and that's it. Uh, but sometimes that just isn't enough. Um, the batch just, you know, has that habit of disappearing, um, and you may not be finished with a project. Um, it's it, batches aren't good for ongoing projects, or may not be good for ongoing projects um, where you might need to change items back. Maybe you're setting them to a different location for summer reading and want to change them back at the end of that, um, or where another staff member needs to look at the list, or you're you're working on a a project that just where you want to um, save things as a as a a, a permanent or or at least durable um, batch. So the solution for that is item buckets. So the item buckets are group of groups of items that stay on the system as long as you want, that can be shared with other staff, um, and they're uh, associated with your login until you delete them, emptying, in fact, those buckets. Um, so one way um, to get items into an item bucket is from the item status screen. So I've scanned all of these or I've uploaded that um, text file of them. And one of my actions here, I've selected them all. One of my actions here is to add to an item bucket. And so if I do that, um, they will be in a bucket. And it will give me the option to add to a, an existing bucket. So that's a drop down list of the buckets that are associated with my login or to start a new bucket. And there's my list. I'm going to add apparently this to a selected bucket. Um, you can also go directly to the item bucket screen, um, either from the menu or from the uh, splash page um, and open the item buckets interface that way. And this is the interface. Um, the word buckets is a drop down and it's open here. Um, so at the top of the list, I have some actions like start a new bucket. Um, and I have also a list of the buckets that I already have. Uh, so I can choose biographies or children's China fiction or whatever to open that, or I can click on the new bucket uh, option there um, to uh, create a new bucket. So I'm making this, I'm adding a new bucket. I'm calling it my picture book project and I'm giving it a description. It's a good idea to give it a description. Um, sometimes I have a habit of calling them like my special project and then I can't remember what special project this was. So use that description. Shareable, if you, um, make a bucket shareable. It can be accessed by any staff member, but how this works is dependent on you, how your system has set up the view container permission. Um, there's an option to open a shared bucket. This is um, both more and less than it seems. Um, the only way you can open a shared bucket is if you have the bucket ID. Um, so I could set up my bucket and I could send a message to three staff members saying, um, take a look at the bucket um, 3629. Um, those are the things that I'm planning to delete or planning to move into a, a new section or whatever. So this is waiting for us to type in a bucket ID. And uh, just speaking of bucket IDs, on this screen, which is a bucket that's open, um, you'll see that uh, right above that buckets drop down, it gives us a bucket ID. That's the number you need to give somebody else if you want them to be able to open the bucket that you have. Uh, so the item bucket interface has two tabs, it has the bucket view, and that's what we're looking at now. And it also has the pending items uh, view. And the pending items view is useful if you're trying to add new uh, barcodes to this, new items to this. Um, so I opened it here and I have the option to scan some items and those items will go into the bucket that's currently open. And that's that children's relocation project. So from pending, I can scan more items to add them. Uh, but you can't 
do all those other ways to add things that you can in item status. Um, so um, the other option, if you wanted to add some items to a bucket, is to go over to item status, scan or upload um, the CSV file or the text file of barcodes, um, select them all, and then use the action to add the items to a bucket rather than scanning them all in by hand if you happen to have um, a file of the barcodes. Um, you can also add individual items to a bucket. So I'm just looking at an item record um, and I think this looks like something I might like to add to a particular bucket that I already have. Um, so I can just open this directly and, and add that uh, there. Um, when I'm looking at this bucket, I can, just like an item status, I can select a group of items or a single or, or all of the items. And then in the actions menu, I have actions to do things with these. But you see, I have a lot fewer actions than I had over on item status. I can't, for example, update the inventory date on these or do, you know, I have a much, much shorter list of things. However, one of the options on this list is open an item status. Um, so if you're trying to do anything more than one of these basic tags, you just take your bucket, move it over into item status where you have all of those, uh, that much longer list of options. So we are, have now completed talking about item records and we're gonna look at some um, um, things to having to do with bibliographic records. And that's what a basket is. So in both the public and the staff catalog, baskets can be used um, to place holds on a batch of titles. And in the public catalog, the basket replaces uh, what we used to have, which was temporary lists. And it gives um, patrons a way to um, select a group of items and then do something with them, like just place holds on them, or also move them into a new or existing my list. Those are called book bags kind of behind the scene, but uh, um, as far as the patron interface is concerned, those are my lists. And in the staff catalog, baskets can be used to select a group of titles and move them into a bucket, um, as well as being used to place holds. Um, but you need to be sure that you clear the bucket, especially when placing holds, or clear the bucket. Um, you have to explicitly clear the bucket. It doesn't just disappear the way the batches do, um, so that you don't, for example, place a hold on a batch of things, forget to clear that, and then, you know, place a hold for the next patron on that same batch of things. And the records stay in the baskets until they're cleared or until the end of your evergreen session. So here I am in the Angular staff catalog and I am um, checking things for a project. So I checked that second book and the fourth book in the list. Um, you can see if you look at the little basket icon in the upper right, the little blue basket little kind of market basket there. It says that there are 11 things that have been, that are in my basket. As I check and uncheck titles, that number will go up and down. So anything that you check ends up in the basket. Um, so you can be shopping around. I could do a totally different search. This was apparently a search on whales. I could go ahead and do a search on sharks and be again, selecting and deselecting items, and they will end up in that same basket. Um, so you can, you don't have to put them in a basket, you're putting them in the basket by the fact that you're selecting them. Um, when you have them in a basket, one of the things that you can do is place holds from the basket. Uh, so here I'm going to place a hold by barcode for the patron. Um, in, the, in the staff interface, it, it gives you the option to place it for your staff account, but it knows you're probably placing it for a patron. So I can enter that patron's barcode or go search for them. Um, 
I have a pickup location. I can suspend the hold. Uh, the number of copies is there. I've got the notification options and all of that. And I can go ahead and place the hold. So I'm placing the hold for uh, these four, four um, titles. And it gives me what what's down below there. Um, it gives me the uh, hold status. So in this case, all four of these holds were successfully placed. And it would give you different messages if for some reason this patron can't place a hold for one of these titles. Uh, maybe one of the titles is an ebook or something that, or a reference book that you know doesn't circulate. Um, so you place holds on the whole batch and then you get the success or failure um, messages for each specific title. And this is me doing the same thing. Um, and I'm not sure why this slide is here. Um, so record buckets are persistent containers for bibliographic records. They stay just like the item buckets. They stay on the system associated with your account until you delete them. And they're useful for multiple pur purposes, including merging duplicate bib records, um, doing batch edits, record edits, um, building carousels, uh, many different things. So again, we're back here in the catalog and selecting individual titles. Um, and I have six things that are currently in this basket and I've got some basket options. I can view the basket, which means um, I wanna see what's it, what exactly is in there. Um, I can place a hold, which is what we did last time. I can print the title details. I can email the title details. Um, but the one we're gonna talk about, I can export the records, which is interesting. But the one we're gonna talk about is adding the basket to a bucket. So I, you know, I've, I mean, I think of this as like a store, you know, you're walking around and you're putting things in your basket. Occasionally you're taking things out of your basket. And then when you're done, um, you go cash out. Well, adding the basket to the bucket is permanently, um, you know, adding these to a permanent bucket so that you can come back and work on them um, at any time. Uh, so in this case, I'm adding um, six things to the bucket. Um, I have the option to um, add things to an existing bucket, a new bucket, or a shared bucket. And this is um, one thing that I think is in the um, that's in the Angular staff catalog and not in the traditional staff catalog, which is being able to add things directly to a shared bucket and it will ask me for the bucket ID there. Now there's a record query. So over in the record buckets, and we could have gone to this directly from the splash page, but when you're in the record buckets, you have two things that are very similar to the item buckets. You have the option of choosing a bucket and opening it, and that's the bucket view tab. You have the pending records tab, which is a way to add some more items here. But you also have this tab in the right, which is called record query. And this allows you to um, enter a query and get everything that matches it. Um, so in this case, I said I was looking for everything that, that the subject matched the words ocean and I truncated that with the asterisk so that I would also get oceans, oceanography, oceanographer, and, and so on. And I did this search and here are my search results and I could go select them all or select some of them and add them to a bucket directly or add them depending because then, then I'm gonna like choose another bucket to add them to. Um, the, the record query does have a limit. I think a thousand is the um, is the maximum limit, um, which is uh, sometimes a problem when we're doing a, a project across the across the system. 
And here's the syntax for this. Um, you can search author, title, subject, or keyword. So it's author, colon, uh, title, colon, and so on. If you don't specify something, you'll get keyword. Um, you can uh, limit to items owned or licensed by your library using located URIs and the, lo the uh, library short name. Um, you can use the Boolean operators in that um, sometimes difficult to remember evergreen syntax. So ampersand ampersand is the syntax for and, and pipe pipe is the syntax for, for or, and um, you can move the rec records uh, to a bucket or a downloaded CSV. So some examples are um, AUTIS truncated, defined everything in the database that has to do with autism, and then use that from a collection management viewpoint to find um, outdated materials, particularly popular materials, all of that. And there's subject ocean, again, truncated. And I'm only looking for things that are associated with Wakefield, which for, for Noble is um, Wakefield items or located URIs, um, uh, which is a feature we use that are um, limited to Wakefield. And then you can get really fancy with the parentheses. So I wanted things with the subject Christmas that also had the word Netherlands or Dutch or Holland. So I put pipes between those and I put in good Boolean syntax, I put um, uh, parentheses around them because I want, it has to have the word Christmas and it has to have one of these words. And here I was really into the parentheses and did learning or reading and disability or difference or difficulty or the word dyslexia. So you can get quite complex here and it is, you can get some interesting results um, from a uh, collection management kind of, kind of point of view. However, I have had a really hard time um, getting people <laughs> to use the syntax here and to be comfortable with it. And it's, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it has been cumbersome. And that's why I was so happy to see in release 3.7, I believe, um, the feature to um, add all search results. So here I'm searching limited to Wakefield and I can enter search terms um, and I can, um, select, I have the option here to add all of the search results to a basket. So I don't have to search these. I know I wanted anything that had Zora Neale Hurston in it, and I can select them all and put them in a basket. Um, and this has been great uh, because libraries can do a search using their normal catalog search methods. So they could do this here from uh, from the regular search box, but they could also um, go to an advanced search and mix and match things and and uh, get very specific and get get what they want. Um, and I believe the limit here is also a thousand. Um, but we're now doing a lot of projects that we would have done kind of system wide with me making a file. People can easily do this file um, themselves to. Um, uh, find everything they have on a particular topic or or uh, that has particular words in particular spaces. So add all to add all search results to a basket has been great for us. Um, here's that record bucket interface. Uh, it looks very much like the item bucket interface. The first the the drop down lets us add a new bucket. Um, or choose one of the existing buckets. Um, and um, when we have a bucket selected, we have a batch edit. That's where you can batch edit um, bibliographic records if you have the permission for that. Um, the, um, unfortunately, the bucket and pending tabs don't have an option for adding bibs to the, to the bucket. 
So there isn't a way here to upload a file of bib IDs or um, any of that. It you really have to um, put things um, in here via a basket or um, some other way that I haven't figured out. Um, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> I forgot this. Um, you can add items to a record bucket from item status, which um, is interesting because you're starting with items, but you're adding the item to a record bucket. So basically that means that the item that you're looking at um, is will get the bibliographic record into your record bucket. And of course the record bucket is associated with all the items that are attached to that. Um, so that is a, another way to, to get items into a record bucket. And when you're working on a project, so I'm looking at this, um, at uh, the Underground Railroad, um, there is under, under, at, under other actions, the option to add a record to a bucket. So maybe you started a bucket one way, uh, but then you're searching around other books that you feel belong in this um, same bucket for whatever purpose, and you can add them individually to the record bucket. Um, looking here at my uh, at my at one of my record buckets, I can select them all, and I have some different options that I can use. I can show the selected records in the catalog. That's very useful. I wouldn't do it if I had too many because it opens each one in a new tab. So that you know, it it I, I would use that for a few records at a time. Um, I can move the selected records to pending records, and the reason you might want to do that is maybe I have some children's titles here and some adult titles here, or some older titles and some newer titles. I might want to move some of these to pending records and then open a new bucket and move them from pending records into that new bucket. Um, basically, moving things back and forth from pending is a way to start a new bucket with some of the records from the first bucket or to merge two buckets or to divide a, a big one bucket into two buckets. Um, so you've got a lot of options there to move things back and forth. Um, I can remove some of these from the bucket. I can transfer title holds. I can merge selected records, um, or I can export the, the records. Um, the merging records, which is something that I have to do quite often, um, is something that I find like a really well-designed screen. So I've selected two records. I could select three or more. I, I select two records here um, and I want to merge them together. One is a duplicate record of the other. Um, I get to decide which one I want to use as the lead record. So which one do I want to end up with? Basically, which one is the better record here? Um, so I decide which one I want to use. I can also remove one from uh, consideration. Maybe I've opened three um, records that looked identical to me that are all great expectations. Uh, but then when I look at the details of them, one of them is, is, has something different. It's a different publisher or something. So I can take it out of here. Uh, the one you select as the lead record, you have the option to edit it just directly here or using the full editor. Um, you can select a merge profile if that's relevant for what you're doing. And then you can click on the merge button to merge them together. So this is a, um, a very useful cataloging tool um, for dealing with um, duplicate records. And now we're patrons. So patrons have baskets just like staff has baskets. You see it's almost the same icon here. Uh, this patron has done a search on the subject Greenland and they're looking at a bunch of search results. Um, as they click on things, they go into the basket. So the, there are now 10 things in the basket. If I uncheck this, we'd be down to nine things in a basket. 
Um, if a patron is looking for things and they're going to place holds on them, sometimes at the start of their search, um, they decide that this is, looks like a wonderful book on Greenland, but further down in the list, they may find some that were published more recently than, than 2005, so they can remove this. So they, you know, they get to kind of negotiate around what they want to have in their record. I'm showing getting these from search results, but this will stay if I now change and do a subject Iceland, I, I still have the same basket here. Um, so I can, you know, I, I can do multiple different searches um, and everything goes in the same basket. And patrons have the option to place holds, um, a, a, a batch hold on all the things in their basket. And they only have to look at one list of pick up location, yes, by, uh, by email and so on. So they can uh, place a single hold. Now you notice that this one is going to be a problem because it's an ebook, uh, but they will also get what we saw staff getting, which is a status message for each hold. So it may be that the first and the third, the hold was placed select, um, successfully, but not that ebook. Um, the other thing that patrons can do uh, with a basket is they can add the basket to a saved list. So these are the my lists. Um, this is that my list functionality. Um, so they can add that to a saved list. It's the patron equivalent of a bucket. Um, when they get to this screen, they have the option of creating a new list and giving this new list a, a name. So maybe they're calling this one uh, Greenland School Project or whatever, and they're giving it a list description. Um, they can also opt to share this list or not to share this list. Um, and they can go back and, and change that option at any time. So if this is just my attempt to save a my, you know, the books that I'm interested in for my Greenland project, um, but I have no reason to share this with anybody, then, then I would just give it a title and, and description and save it here. Um, but if I wanted to make this be something that I can share with other members of my class, or I'm a teacher, or I'm a scout leader, or a book group leader, or whatever, I may be wanting to make something that is shareable, in which case I would set that to to yes. Um, in this case, Matt Bird here, our, our, our patron has a list that he has marked as shareable. When he marks it shareable, um, we have the option to hide. So hide and share are kind of a toggle. So if he decides he doesn't want to share it anymore, he would click on this. But when he does share it, um, he gets this HTML view and that's what I'm looking at here. So he gets this list. I, I've cut the header off here. He gets this list of Matt Bird's birds. So these are all his books about birds that he's recommending. Um, this has a URL that is a permanent stable URL. It's as permanent or stable until he deletes it. Um, but it's shareable so that he can uh, post this on his website, on social media, on a class page, or whatever, and recommend these books, um, giving other patrons an easy way to add them to their list or to place a hold on them, or, or of course, this is just a catalog page in essence, or to click through and get more information on, on that. Um, that is a, a, a function that I feel we could all, or at least at, at Noble, I feel we need to do a better job of, of promoting that to patrons and knowing that they can make their own list and share it um, there. Now, the interesting kind of thing here is um, that you can open a, a, a my list in the staff web client. So if Matt Bird came and said, you know, you want to do something with my bird project thing, um, this 
URL, this is what the URL would look like that was created um, here. So, so this HTML view. And it has the word book bag in it, um, but it also has a number, 4580102. If I were in the staff client, I can open that because I it's a it's basically um, a book bag ID. And I should have fixed this because this that load shared bucket bucket ID has been corrected since I did this slide. So I now have opened um, that my list that started in the patron interface. Um, I was able to open that as a record bucket. Now, I don't know how often patrons are like asking you if you're interested in their list. Um, sometimes people might be talking to a book group leader and finding that they have done this and, you know, and you might want to build on this. Um, but libraries can also have, may have library staff who would rather be logged into the catalog view um, or volunteers or, or other people who make a my list that then the library wants to make a bucket and do more with. So this is how you open a list in the bucket interface. You just need that magic um, ID number. Um, so this is staff doing this. Um, using this interface to, to be able to um, create a basket, um, take the stuff from the basket, turn it into a new list, give it um, a title and, an, and a description, offer to share it, and then they're moving the contents of the basket into this list. And there's the, um, remembering Eric Carl um, uh, basket that was created by staff using the, uh, the interface here. And I just have one thing to say about carousels. Uh, so carousels are great. They, they create very nice looking carousels that are on the, on the uh, main page of your, of your catalog. We use them kind of extensively. Um, one way to create a carousel is from a bucket. Um, and this is great when you have a thematic carousel. It's really, it's like a book display. So it's not just new books. It's, it's a, a selection of books. So you create a bucket and you choose, you hand choose the titles that you want to go into this. So here I have 12 items. Um, they're actually bibliographic records. Um, that I, um, that are Nordic Noir. Um, and so I've added them here. And in the bucket interface, I have the option to create a carousel from this bucket. And when I choose that, um, it, it um, asks me for a title. So I called the bucket Nordic Noir, but now that it's going to be a carousel, I want to call it Dark Tales from the Land of the Midnight Sun and create it. Now here's the confusing thing. There are also options here that you use um, when you're adding a carousel where you um, choose uh, where you want to have it appear on the screen and so on. Um, but the, the thing here is when you create a bucket from a carousel, so this is the one that is associated with dark tales from the mid land of the midnight sun, it didn't use my bucket, it, it copied my bucket and made its own new bucket out of that. Um, this we found confusing when we would be trying to go back to the bucket that we created it from and editing that bucket and it didn't make a difference in the carousel. Uh, but it's giving you the hint right there that it's like, this is not bucket 519, whatever. This is a copy of that um, that the system made for the purpose of doing the carousel. Um, so I can open that. Here's my system created um, carousel. This is the one that was created for the carousel. 
Um, so looking at this, I can add or remove titles from this, which will be added or removed from, um, from the carousel. But I also still have the bucket that I created in the first place. Um, maybe I want 12 titles in the carousel, but I'm really doing a much larger Nordic Noir project. So I'm going to continue adding things to that for a book display. And I want a larger selection of that, or I'm doing something else with those. Um, but carousels, um, uh, this kind of carousel, things that are created from a bucket, make their own copy um, rather than use the original bucket itself. And that's about it. The, um, what we looked at were item records, a batch in item status for temporary use, um, an item bucket, a persistent group of uh, items that stay on the system until the bucket is deleted, and for bibliographic records, a basket is a temporary group of items that go away when you clear or end the session. Um, and that applies to both patrons and staff. And the record buckets are for staff, a persistent group of records that stay on the system until the bucket is deleted. And a book bag is the patron versions version of a record bucket, um, but may also be a handy way for staff to create um, uh, lists that can be shared. Uh, any questions? Uh, there's one question, how do you get to the carousel configuration page, which if you want to take take that, Elizabeth. Sure. Um, in, in, if, uh, it's up in the, right, I don't have the staff client. client yeah, open. so it's, it's in the administration menu. It's in the administration under, I believe, local administration. And yeah. the reason I'm temporarily blanking on that is actually in our system, we added it to, um, to the navigation um, so we could get to it more easily. Uh, but it oh, is in, interesting, yeah. it is in administration under, I believe, local administration. And the carousels, um, this is only one way to create a carousel. If you haven't used them for things like new items, you can set them up to refresh themselves and create carousels of new items in your new adult fiction collection and, and uh, make them just a recurring thing that, that maintain themselves. In Evergreen, Indiana, we have all of the automatic carousel types, which are, those are set up in the server admin menu, which you may or may not have access to. Okay. Um, we administer all of those centrally, but that's, that's specific to our consortium. That may be different for others. Uh, but the manual uh, buckets, which is essentially what um, Elizabeth is talking about, are all done through the local admin menu, unless it's been changed locally. Yes. A comment from Anita. I wish you could go backward from record bucket to item bucket item status to do you mean to open um uh, item status well you really probably couldn't because you don't know how many items are attached to a record yeah they're they're um <laughs> what i'm going to add to the slides including fixing those few few uh, errors there um i um, are some of my favorite uh, bucket bugs. Um, mostly, they're mostly wish list bugs, um, but I, I, um, I think they're just such a wonderful feature and so useful in everything from book display kinds of things to, to uh, um, you know, data cleanup kinds of things. Um, and I do have a um, long list of uh, wish list um, improvements and things that I um, that I think would uh, make them even easier to use and and uh, more more powerful. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll just I'll just throw some of those bug uh, things in the yeah. last slide. I have I have a very soft spot in my heart for anything that has to do with bucket functionality. So 
Uh, there is a comment from Lene about um, deleting things from item status, which Elaine answered, uh, can you delete an item from the item status screen in order to download the CSV? Unfortunately, no, but Elaine gives um, the workaround for that, that you can add those things that you want into an item bucket, refresh your item status, go into that item that bucket, and then open everything that's in it into item status again and download uh, your CSV file from there. Now that you've cleaned it up a little bit, remove that mistake. Um, and, I, and I see that Rachel is asking if there's a way to find the bucket if you lose the bucket number. Um, I don't know if there's a way to find it other than if it's your own, you can look in the drop down. Um, I don't think there's a way to look by title or creator. Um, and I think my, there's my, a bug about that, though. Is there not a way to search? There are, there are bugs about a lot of these things. Yeah. Are, again, mostly wish list items. Um, one that we looked at recently, I feel like. Yeah, one of one of mine is called like improvements to to bucket sharing, yeah. and um, I would love these to work more like um, like like Gmail and Google Google Drive or something like that, where you can um, share things specifically. Mm -hmm. So I can share this with you, and then it would appear in a drop down that's your shared buckets. Right. You know, so that rather than expecting people to remember numbers or go find them or whatever. Yeah. And I, I know I know we have libraries where they have like a list of the record number, the bucket numbers for their for various projects and things. Sure, um, but part of the thing of having an ILS is to get away from having all the yeah, yeah. external spreadsheets and things. So um, Yeah. Well they're okay. they're so useful shared for so many different kinds of projects. I, I would love to see. Um, to see more. Yes. We have just a few more minutes before um, we go into, I believe, lightning talks start at three. Let me double check that. So I guess we have more than just a few more minutes. If you have. Yes, they start at 3 p.m. So I think you would need sysadmin to, yeah, it, Elaine makes the point that at this point, if you wanted to find one that didn't belong to you, even if it was shared, it's essentially a SQL query to look for that. And then it still is not particularly well exposed as to what it is, unless you know who created it. But then if you know who created it, then you can just ask for the number. Um, I don't use buckets as much as I should, but you just gave me an idea of, oh, fantastic. Melissa, Melissa is actually an evergreen Indiana, so I'm going to speak to her directly. I did not use buckets for probably the first five years that I used evergreen. Um, and then I like used it for one specific thing, and then I realized, oh, I can use this for everything. And I probably use um, at least two buckets a day now. So, yeah, it's, it's that's at least two. Sometimes it's a way more. They're lovely. Anita says, showing items from an item bucket into item status allows you to. <laughs> Anita Brown loves conjoined items, and we do have a video in Evergreen Indiana about that. And this is where she um, organizes her things for conjoining. And, and see, that's that's what's so great about, about that item status screen. It has every function that it's oh possible yeah. to do with an item, including some that I'm like, what's that? Oh, when that feature came out where you could open everything into item status, it was like I had reached a certain stage of nirvana. But I mean, of course, this thing's going. Um, Mike says, as a note for developers, we could use object. Oh, I see you're sharing with the developers in here. I'm like, ah. object permissions to share buckets. Good, Mike, do it. <laughs> and Elaine says, I use buckets all the time. Yes, I have a number with different cleanup projects I am working on. That And that goes back to um, naming of the buckets. I And Elizabeth, you talked about giving a description that's not my latest project. Yeah. Um, the title itself is probably important as well to, you know, you know, clue yourself in on what you probably forgot 
from six months ago if you're going to use the bucket over and over. Um, are there any size limits on batches or buckets we should be aware of, either enforced in the software? I will say for a practical consideration, from my standpoint, a 5,000 um, item bucket is where I have found the limit there, but it's more about the limit being how many records per page you have exposed. So if you expose, and this is only in item buckets because in record buckets, there are limits already imposed. You can only expose or display a hundred in record buckets. And I'm not sure, Elizabeth, that that's also the case in user buckets. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. And I, you know, I, I didn't add user buckets here, but, but uh, um, we're using user buckets more now because the, that's the basis of hold groups, mm -hmm. um, which we're uh, which we've been using. Um. Yes, and that's another thing that's not copied. It wasn't covered in here, but it's basically a session or five in itself is um, the the hold subscription groups and how they utilize buckets as well. Um, we are new to Evergreen. I must admit, I never thought about using buckets to put multiple books on hold for a single patron there well yes things baskets buckets of course now to figure out how to create a list bucket i can share with patrons melissa you know where i am yeah I, elaine says she has um buckets with with thousands of records mm -hmm. it, it probably is more a matter a practical matter of what kind of project you're doing yeah um so you know, if you're doing a big system-wide project where you're trying to clean up some data or whatever, you may have very large ones. Um, in in a in a single library, you're, it may be more a matter of first I'm going to deal with the graphic novels and this change we're going to make, and now I'm going to deal with some other area just to, you know, trying to trying to trying to break a larger project down into reasonable chunks, whatever that may be. For display purposes, at least in the item buckets, I usually limit that display to between um, 250 to 500 records and something big, unless I need to be handling each record and then I limit it smaller. So I can just keep track of where I'm at. Yeah, Jeremy's comment about um, not trying yeah. to edit a large group of, of items, that's, that's certainly an issue and we, Yes. We find about 200 or so um, being a, uh, a, a limit. But of course, you can always select the first 200 and then edit them and then, you know, uh, um, you know, do batches that way. And to Jeremy's point about editing those items, if you're talking about fully editing it and you would be then opening all of those things into the holdings editor. Yeah. And that has some other practical considerations as far as timeouts and things. Then we had some trouble with batch edits to the status seeming to time out with just a couple hundred items. Um, Allison's point about um, adding the status column um, is, a, is a good one. Um, often, yeah, I mean, you really want to look at what columns you want to use for, for whatever you're trying to do, which may be different than the column settings for normal use, for non-project use. Um, so when you're, you know, when you're trying to look at something um, because you're planning on deleting them or whatever, then you really want to have that item status there. Um, but, uh, um, you know, for other kinds of things that, that you, you might want to have other kinds of things on the screen. Jeremy, how are you doing watching two, two sessions at once? <laughs> he's watching the other <laughs> session. Oh, he's busy commenting on the other session. Yeah, that's good. Yes, the is deleted column is so helpful. Yeah, all of these columns are useful depending on what you're trying to do. There is one missing in item buckets that I am pushing to be developed in there, and that is if the item has parts assigned to it. Yeah. 
we need a parts column. If anybody's, you know, in here and raring to get in there and develop as we go. <laughs> yeah, there are items that need labels and print from the item bucket. Yeah, and that's a, that's a pretty regular workflow now that that has been integrated to that. Okay, well, I think that's my time. And uh, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Right. That was great. A lot of great things to like leap off from. You know, I got a few um, specific things I'm going to go back to right now. So we do have lightning talks at three o'clock. They are not in this session. They are, have their own session. Um, and then following that, there will be, I think, two more sessions in this track uh, later this afternoon. So thank you, everyone. And we will see you hopefully in the lightning talks in half an hour.